Another day in med school means more lessons to learn. It's Wednesday, meaning another long lecture in biochemistry. That is our yummy professor. He's pretty cute. Too bad. No one listens to his lessons. They could transport digestion and absorption? I don't like. I tried reading about it last night, but it bored me to death. There are some useful instructional videos on the internet, aside from semi-nude pictures of Brad Pitt. Wonder if I still remember the one I watched yesterday. I'm just here for attendance. Actually, no matter how long I sit here, I'm not gonna learn a lot anyway. Hmm. Wonder... Wait, who's texting me? Oh, got by again tomorrow. Got to study. What's our topic again? Wait, what page was that? Where is it? What page? Ah, where, where, where? Oh, okay, here it is. What the hell am I reading? Mm, nah, I'll try to find an easier way to learn about it in the internet. Wait, uh, there it is, there. Lipids constitute an important part of the diet. An average ingestion, absorption, and transport of an individual is about 60 to 130 grams of fats daily, mostly in the form of tags. Lipid is known to be an organic solvent. It is synthesized by the liver and adipose tissue and being transported in various tissues and organs for utilization and storage. Because of their insolubility in an aqueous solution system, special mechanisms are required for their absorption by the intestine. They are first combined with an amphipatic lipid and proteins, namely cholesterol, cholesterol esters, triglycerides, phospholipids, and non-esterified fatty acids which is considered the simplest lipid. They are transported in the blood by four major plasma lipoprotein classes and several quantitatively minor lipoproteins. Those four major lipoproteins are chylomicron, VLDL, LDL or bad cholesterol, and HDL or good cholesterol. Day in and day out, we eat many different kinds of foods to live. But have you ever wondered what happens to the food we eat? The moment we put food in our mouth, the process, the process of digestion immediately takes place. This is how it happens. As food is placed inside the mouth, the teeth, muscles of mastication, and the tongue are responsible for the cutting tearing and grinding down of food to small bits and pieces. It is necessary for digestion and absorption of specific nutrients and macromolecules. Certain enzymes act on chewed food called as bolus. These enzymes, like the salivary amylase, act on carbohydrates to be facilitated on its absorption, but for protein and especially fat, no enzymatic reactions happen in the mouth. So now we saw the first step involved in the digestion of lipids. But things get a bit more complicated after that. Breaking down lipids is no simple task. Liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and even the stomach and small intestines themselves work together to break down these lipids. And this is how it happens.
in the stomach, the first thing that happens is that two lipases act on the triglycerides. The first lipase, lingual lipase, comes from glands at the back of the tongue. This lipase particularly targets fatty acids of short or medium chain length. Those with less than 12 carbons like milk fat. The second lipase, gastric lipase, also acts on the same fatty acids. This time, this gastric lipase is secreted by the gastric mucosa. Both lipases have a pH optimum of pH 4 to 6. After that, emulsification now occurs in the duodenum of the small intestine. Emulsification is an important process for it increases the surface area of the lipids so the digestive enzyme can act more effectively. Two mechanisms promote emulsification, bile salts and mechanical mixing due to peristalsis. Bile salts are derivatives of cholesterol that are made in the liver but stored in the gallbladder. They consist of a sterile ring structure with a side chain to which a molecule of glycine or taurine is covalently attached by an amide linkage. Bile salts interact with the lipid particles and aqueous duodenal contents, stabilizing the particles and preventing them from coalescing. Finally, pancreatic enzymes now act on the triacylglycerol, cholesterol esters, and phospholipase. Pancreatic lipase acts on triacylglycerol molecules, which removes fatty acids at carbon 1 and 3, forming two monoacylglycerol and three fatty acids. A second protein, colipase, also secreted by the pancreas, binds the lipid at 1 to 1 ratio. Cholesterol esters, on the other hand, are hydrolyzed by cholesterol ester hydrolase, which produces cholesterol and free fatty acids. The activity of this enzyme is greatly increased in the presence of bile salts. And lastly, phospholipase A2 acts on phospholipids. Phospholipase A2 is activated by trypsin and it actively also increases in the presence of bile salts. Phospholipase A2 removes one fatty acid from carbon-2, leaving a lysophospholipid. The remaining fatty acid at carbon-1 is removed by lipophospholipase, leaving a glyceryl phosphoryl base which can be absorbed, further digested, or excreted. These pancreas secretions are hormonally regulated. Cholecystokinin or CCK is produced by the mucosa of the jejunum and the lower duodenum in response to the presence of lipids. CCK acts on the gallbladder and exocrine cells in the pancreas, causing them to release bile and digestive enzymes respectively. CCK also decreases gastric motility. Another hormone, secretin, causes the pancreas and liver to release a watery solution rich in bicarbonate to neutralize the pH of the intestinal contents and bring them to a level more appropriate for enzyme activity. Let's take a short break now that we've ended the first half.